Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Korlick with Figure It Out Productions. The following video is part of our quick shoot series. Hey guys, it's Adam here and welcome to the totally unexpected part 7 of my second video game generation retrospective or recap series. Uh, before we talk about the elephant in the room, and I don't mean me, thank you for the fat jokes. Um, no, uh, part 1 of this series was on the uh, generation as a whole. Part 2 was on the Atari 2600. Part 3 was on the Magnavox Odyssey 2. Part 4 was on the Mattel Intellivision. Part 5 on the Coleco ColecoVision. And Part 6 on the Atari 5200. Part 7 is the actual elephant in the room. The uh, GCE or Milton Bradley Vectrex. Now if you guys have been watching this series then you know that I didn't own a Vectrex. I made that very clear. <laughs> and now all of a sudden I have one. I wasn't expecting that to be the case, hence in the previous video I said that was the end of the series. Well, no surprise, I managed to get one, so we're going to do a video on it. And it just, as it happens, it actually came out after the Atari 5200, so it kind of works out nicely. Uh, before we talk about how I got this, my personal experience, all that stuff, let's talk about the history a little bit, though. Okay, so this thing, the uh, basically it's uh, it was conceived back when a company called Smith Engineering, uh, they had been working on a lot of uh, portable gaming devices, like early handhelds and stuff, and they saw some success with that. So they kind of liked the idea of not uh, being dependent upon a television to basically play your games. Uh, so they proposed the idea of taking that and consoleizing it. Uh, so they took it to GCE. Who said, yeah, we, we, could, we could totally do that. And uh, they released this thing in 1982 in uh, North America. Now, uh, it was basically out for a year, and then the video game crash happened, and it was pretty much killed off right then and there, or should have been. Uh, I'm glad it wasn't, but you know that realistically should have been the end of it, uh, economics, uh, economically speaking. But uh, Milton Bradley, uh, you guys might know them, they uh, make a lot of like board games and stuff. They basically came in and uh, they looked at the Vectrex and thought, that thing's pretty cool, uh, here's what we're going to do. They basically bought GCE uh, and they decided to pump a lot of cash into the Vectrex. And it kept it alive for about another year. Um, they also decided under Milton Bradley to release the, uh, the platform in um, Europe and in Japan. However, in Japan they released it under Bandai's name. So uh, I think in North America they kept it under GCE. So this, uh, this console was released by three different companies, um, sort of. Uh, basically in Japan it was by Bandai, in North America it was GCE, and in Europe it was Milton Bradley. Um, as odd as that may sound. Uh, but yeah, in Europe it actually saw some decent success. North America did okay, and in uh, Japan, it, uh, as usual, it's an American device. Uh, it's going to tank. Uh, so, yeah, it, uh, it was whatever. But uh, yeah, it lasted for about two years, and then by that point it was, it was done. Uh, Milton, ba Milton Bradley pulled out. Too bad, because it's actually a pretty cool device. Um, I mean, again, the logic with this thing was that um, uh, a lot of people, you have to remember at the time it was released in the early 80s, people, if they even owned a television, they had one. Uh, so if people are playing video games on it, if the kids are playing video games on it, the parents can't watch television or whatever. So this thing would give you the monitor so you can give the kids this thing, let them go play it, and then the parents can continue to uh, watch television or whatever. Uh, and there's less you know, demand over fighting over who has the, uh, the television space. It's interesting because they knew they were going to have its own monitor, so they took advantage of that. They gave it a monitor that's capable of vector graphics. Because of that, the visual style is actually incredibly unique, rather than using pixels. Um, so, it's one of these things that you don't really believe until you see it in person, but I swear to you, the image clarity on this screen is sublime. It's absolutely fantastic. And, uh, it, you know, and I, I'm sure there's already people going, but the graphics are old, they suck. It's not graphics we're talking about here. The visual clarity of the image is super sharp. It's very clear. It's not fuzzy. It's not distorted. It doesn't look like something you would think the 80s would look like. It's not like connecting one of those the previous second gen consoles I've talked about. You connect them to a television through RF and there's like distortion in the image. This doesn't have that. It's just a really pure clean image. Um, which is nice. However, it's not like it doesn't have its downsides. Uh, the console was only capable of black and white, which is why you see this overlay on it. Now that overlay will come off and you would just see the, uh, the base uh, screen of any particular game. So the, since they couldn't give you color, they would give you overlays with every single game to kind of enhance the experience, basically. Um, 
I, I'm not a big fan of overlays, but when you're controlling the monitor, it's easier to produce overlays because they're always going to fit. But as per usual, people just lose them and stuff. Of course, one of the other problems with this thing is that since it is the monitor and it has no video output, there really is no other way to use it, which is, you know, kind of odd for a game console. Uh, you know, obviously it can be emulated and stuff, but it's just, it's just not it's just not the same experience. Um, obviously, it is a big console. It's not as heavy as you might expect it to be, which is nice. Um, <clears throat> very cool design in a lot of ways. It's, it is just a, a really badass, awesome thing. Um, looking more at the console itself, uh, down here you have your controller. The controller is basically housed in the console. However, it's not hardwired though it's not the easiest thing to get out. There's a little, basically a little clip in there, and then you can pull the controller out like that. And uh, the controller looks like this. It's got four buttons and a, uh, a, like a joystick, basically. And it's connected in here in a controller port, uh, which is a DIM9 controller port, which is basically the same port that the Sega Genesis or Mega Drive used. Uh, however, the plastic casing around it is a little different, so as a result, the Genesis or Mega Drive controller won't actually fit in there. However, I've been told that if you were to cut part of that controller's cable, or, you know, heaven forbid, the, the actual console itself, which I highly wouldn't recommend, you could actually get it to fit in there, and if it did, it should work. Um, that's what I've been told. There's a second controller port, because again, a lot of the things they wanted to do with this was to promote multiplayer. Uh, you were supposed to bring the home console experience uh, to this thing, or the home arcade experience, I'm sorry. And uh, so if you had two controllers, that would uh, definitely make that easier to do. Uh, there's also a switch in there, which is like a volume dial and a power switch. Um, this is, as far as I know, never did, never happened in any other console. Basically, you just take the dial and you turn to the right, then the console powers on. And the more you turn to the right, the volume increases. There were older televisions that did that, so logically that's, that's how that came to be. Um, but yeah, the controller, like I said, is not hardwired. It does come out, which is always a good idea because hardwired controllers are really, really stupid. And if you know anything goes wrong with it, you can replace it, which is fantastic. Um, and on the back, there's a dial here to uh, increase or decrease the brightness of the screen, which is also very nice. Uh, but yeah, in, in a nutshell, that's that's pretty much what this thing uh, was. Uh, unfortunately, it, not not surprisingly, it was very expensive to produce uh, because you had to include the monitor every single time, and it didn't exactly sell like gangbusters. So uh, it didn't it did not last that long. It, it did, also didn't have third party support. Uh, every single game produced for this console was by either GCE or Milton Bradley. Now, Milton Bradley bought GCE, so we're really talking about the same entity. And in the end, there was only something like 20 games ever officially produced for it. Um, but uh, it, it's, that's not necessarily the, the worst thing ever. Eventually, what happened with this thing is that it ended up in the public domain. And so uh, the independent scene has been producing games for it. There's a lot of people who are very loyal to this ma machine. They think it's really cool. So they make new games for it. There's also flashcards available because a lot of the games are really hard to find and really expensive, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I should have mentioned it before. Uh, if you have a cartridge game such as this one here, there is a cartridge slot on the side, and you just plug it in like that. No big deal. Um, now, the cool, one of the coolest things about this console is that if you don't have a cartridge game, there is actually a game built into it. Uh, Mindstorm, which is basically Asteroids. So if you just turn this thing on with no game in it, Mindstorm will come up. And yeah, that's a pretty fun game. That's the one I happen to have the overlay for. The only other game I have is a game called Hyper Chase, uh, which is like an F1 style racing game, you know. Uh, so definitely cool, but uh, obviously that, that's the extent of what I have for this thing. Um, now, there were some cool peripherals that were released for it, especially under the Milton Bradley year. Uh, Milton Bradley put out uh, like a little light pen you could use to kind of interact with the screen, to draw imagery and stuff like that. Uh, there's only a couple of games that supported that, though. They also released some sort of like 3D glasses for this thing, which apparently is the first, this would make it the first video game console ever to support any sort of 3D images. Uh, again, through, you know, special glasses and stuff, but it did technically exist, it did work, but again, only a few games ever supported it. But considering your whole library consists of 20 to 25 games, that's a pretty good percentage of games that actually use it, so there you go. Um, yeah, uh, but, you know, beyond that, there's not much to say about the history of this thing that I can really think of. Uh, so I guess I'll tell you what limited uh, personal experience I have with it. Uh, so as you full well know, I didn't own one of these when I started this same series that I'm doing right now. Uh, and I did not think getting one was going to happen anytime soon because I never see them. And when I do, they're usually very expensive, etc. Um, 
Now, as it happened in the middle of this month, at the time I make this, uh, December 2016, uh, I had to go up to Toronto for a weekend, um, and while I was there, I kind of did the rounds. You know, I saw a bunch of my friends, and I went to some game stores. Uh, and, but one of the game stores I went to was Toy Rat. Now, Toy Rat's one of my favorite video game stores, if not my favorite video game store of all time. I've done videos on it many times there before. Um, but when I was in there, he had something I'd never seen before in my life. A wall of Vectrexes. Try to imagine a wall of these. Not easy. <laughs> But he had them, and I was just like, dude, you know, like, what are you charging for Vectrexes? So long story short, I worked out a deal with him, and uh, he, he sold this to me for a pretty pretty fair price, and he also threw in a bonus copy of Hyper Chase, so I have, I have one cartridge-based game, and of course, in addition to the one that's built into it. Now, uh, you'll get to see that wall of Vectrexes, because I'm gonna, I shot a video in the store, and you'll see it, and it's, it's just a sight to behold, <laughs> because you don't see a wall of Vectrexes very often. But uh, yeah, so that's that's really all that happened is that I, you know he the, he let me play multiple Vectrexes so I could pick out the one I wanted. Um, so I got to try it out, make sure I you know I liked it enough and everything. Uh, it's interesting turning one on for the first time because when you've never used it before, you don't really realize the whole thing with like the volume dial. So I would turn it on, I would hear nothing, then I would have to turn it up, be like, oh, that's how that works, okay. And then, as I said before, until you play one you really have no idea how clear that screen is. Because in my mind, as I'm sure there is in yours, unless you own one of these things, you expect it to look bad just because of when it came out. But it doesn't. It looks very clean. Like Scott the Canadian and I were both in there and we were both playing it. We were both like, this is really surprisingly clean imagery for 1982. This is really impressive. Uh, so we were, yeah, we, we had a fun time with this thing. So that's, uh, but that's, that's really all I, I've done with it so far. So I'm glad I could get it in here and uh, make a video about it for you while I'm still doing the series. So there you go. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and I hope you enjoyed the series overall. I know I already said that in the previous one, but again, at the time I didn't know that I wasn't, I was going to get one of these. So whatever. But uh, yeah, nevertheless, thank you for watching this episode and the, the whole series. Hopefully, if you haven't, you should do that. Uh, stay tuned to that Toy Rat video so that you can see more with the Vectrex. And uh, thank you guys for watching. I will see you all later.